There were death threats, there were bad words written on our car, they looked for bombs, we had armed guards, but um, there was a lot of love in the house, and I think that kind of triumphed over all that and made us feel safe. He was a, he was a goofball. I mean, <laughs> he loved to tell stories, and he loved to tell jokes, and he loved to kind of entertain at home, you know, with, with close friends. So yeah, he was, um, he was a, a really kind, kind-hearted man. And in his own words, Sammy Davis Jr. was the only black, Puerto Rican, one-eyed Jewish entertainer in the world. Not Sammy Davis Jr., oh, that's the black guy that turned Jewish. Oh, that's the guy with the one eye. However, his daughter, Tracy Davis, who died in 2020, shared memories and details of his life in her book, Sammy Davis Jr., A Personal Journey with My Father. The book is based on conversations Davis had with her father as he battled throat cancer near the end of his life. He described his start in vaudeville at three years old, where he was billed as an adult midget. He didn't have the traditional family life, Tracy revealed. He was always working, 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 and trying to become famous. She says that even after making it, he was scared that it could be taken away at any minute. When asked about how her father dealt with accusations of being a sellout, she revealed that he was heartbroken by the claims. He was hurt, but I don't think that that's anything new for black artists even today. When you get to certain level, you kind of need to grow your circle, and I think for the black community at that time, they wanted to have a piece of Sammy Davis Jr., and they didn't really understand that he was giving as much as he could give. Somehow, it just didn't seem good enough. You know, to be called names by your own folks is really hurtful, because then, we're where do you go when times are tough? When your own community, a lot of people, don't think that you're a part of that community anymore? It's a little scary, she said. In any case, over three decades have passed since the untimely demise of Sammy Davis Jr. due to throat cancer, and in that time, his legacy has faced an unsettling fate. To many, he seems to have faded into obscurity or relegated to the status of a bygone relic, a mere footnote from another era, dismissed as a diminutive figure, standing at five foot five, whose existence appears incongruous with the enduring struggle for civil rights among African Americans. Yet, beneath the veneer of forgotten history lies a compelling narrative that unravels the complexities of Hollywood's ability to marginalize an artist based on both race and convictions. So here is the tragic and controversial story, Sammy Davis Jr. For context, Sammy Davis Jr. was born on December 8, 1925, in Harlem. As somewhat of a premonition of his later life, he was born into a very talented family. Davis's father, Sammy Davis Sr. was an entertainer and stage performer, and his mother, Elvira Sanchez, was a stage performer and tap dancer. Both were said to have been vaudeville dancers. Since his parents worked quite a lot in the evening, as most entertainers do, he's said to have been brought up by his paternal grandmother. However, as most entertainers also do, his parents divorced when he was three. His father didn't want to lose custody, so in what was likely a defining moment for Davis, Sammy Davis Sr. decided to take his son on tour with him and Will Mastin. This would proved to be the beginning of an incredible career for Sammy Davis Jr. He quickly learned to dance from his father and his uncle, Will Mastin, and very soon began to perform with the group, which began the Will Mastin Trio. In this act, Davis was apparently billed as Silent Sam, the 44-year-old dancing midget. He continued to perform with the trio all the while developing his entertainment skills. These skills truly came into use in 1941 when the Will Mastin Trio was asked to fill in as an opening act for Frank Sinatra at a gig in Detroit. This particular show would prove to be life-changing for Sammy Davis Jr., but not instantly. In fact, another life-changing event would occur first, World War II. In 1943, Sammy Davis Jr. was drafted into the Army. This particular event was not necessarily life-changing. What affected Davis most about his time in the military, which is our first unfortunate moment in this story, was his first true introduction to blatant racism. During his time in the trio, he had never witnessed this racism outright, because his father and uncle had both kept this from him under the guise of people being jealous of their entertaining skills. However, Davis was placed into one of the Army's first racial integrated units in military history. This would obviously not be smooth sailing for a black man in the 1940s. However, Sammy Davis Jr. was not one to take this sort of thing lying down. Apparently, Davis faced racism so frequently that he was having actual brawls with white soldiers nearly every other day. He described one occasion where a 
white secretary came to ask him a question. A group of white soldiers noticed him speaking with her, and they decided to corner him soon afterwards in the enlisted club. They took him outside, and he fought them all. They overpowered him, stripped him, and painted him white, saying that he obviously wanted to be white if he wanted to talk to white women. Other moments include him having his nose broken numerous times, which gave it its permanently flattened look. On another occasion, he was offered a beer laced with urine. Davis fought every chance he could against the racism he experienced. Everybody knows it is. That ain't no, that ain't no big, big statement to make. It's, it, maybe it's shocking to hear it from someone that you just watched the night before on laughing. Soon, he began to notice that no matter how many times he would fight, the racists would just keep coming. So, he finally decided that there was another way that only he could fight back, through talent and showmanship. After his discharge from the army, Sammy Davis Jr. reunited with the Will Maston trio. However, he started pushing himself to do more than just dance. In addition to his amazing dancing, he began singing and doing impressions. He went to the old soft shoe. His impressions were legendary, and soon the trio gained enough notoriety to make their way into some of the most famous clubs in Las Vegas. The trio was actually being adored at this point, even by white audiences, while they were on stage. When they were off stage, they were treated just as badly as all other African Americans. Apparently, they weren't even allowed to use the front doors of some of the clubs where they were performing. This was a common trend around the United States at the time, even in New York. On one occasion, Davis and a group of his friends went to see Frank Sinatra perform at the New York Club the Copacabana. They were turned away at the door. However, Sinatra made Davis come back the next night and he walked into the club by himself, effectively breaking down a sort of barrier. Through all of this racism, Sammy Davis Jr. never stopped fighting back with talent. This hard work would finally pay off when Davis got his big break. In 1951, the Will Maston Trio was asked to open at the famous Hollywood nightclub Ciro's. The trio was meant to perform for 20 minutes to open for Janice Page. However, the crowd loved the trio so much, Sammy Davis Jr. especially that they continued to perform for almost an hour. After this, Janice Page insisted that the order of the show be flipped to her opening for the trio. Following this, Sammy Davis Jr. was on the rise. He could not be stopped. He was an absolute force to the reckoned with. This man's skills could never be overstated. He could dance like no one else. He could sing just as well as Frank Sinatra. His impressions were uncanny. He was an absolute powerhouse. However, his incredible rise would come with a pretty terrible fall. Davis was driving from Las Vegas to Los Angeles in 1954 when he was almost K in a car crash. The year prior, Davis had befriended a Jewish comedian named Eddie Cantor. Cantor had given Davis a mezuzah, which is a parchment enclosed in a case that is normally fixed to a doorpost. However, Davis had taken to wearing it around his neck for good luck. This car crash happened on the only night that Davis had not been wearing his necklace. During the crash, Davis's eye was damaged because of a bullet-shaped horn button, which led to him losing his left eye completely. He survived the crash, but the loss of his eye meant that he would have to relearn his movements. Obviously, his depth perception was greatly affected by this, and this type of injury can destroy an entertainer's career, especially in this time period. However, instead of letting him sulk due to his injuries, Davis's friends, including Frank Sinatra, pushed him out of bed and towards recovery as soon as possible. He soon regained his footing, just in time for this car crash to make him into a national celebrity. At this point, Sammy Davis Jr. was still making waves. He was writing songs and acting in different television shows and films, all while performing constantly. With all of this hard work came notoriety, but this would also soon turn against him. In 1957, Davis began dating Kim Novak, a white actress. Supposedly, Davis was incredibly in love with Novak, and Novak apparently shared the same feelings. It was really the first moment in Sammy Davis Jr.'s life where he loved someone enough to want to marry them, and this rumor started to spread. However, as with almost every aspect of Davis's life, white people were not happy about this. One particular white racist that didn't like the idea of Davis Davis marrying Novak was her boss, Harry Cohn. Harry Cohn was the head of Kim Novak's film studio, Columbia Pictures. He believed that Novak's marriage to a black man, even an incredibly famous and beloved black man, would affect the studio's profits. So, he did what any sane white man would do. He hired the mob to threaten Sammy Davis Jr. reportedly. The mobsters threatened Davis with blinding his remaining eye and breaking his legs if he didn't marry a black woman within 48 hours. This scare tactic actually worked and completely destroyed Sammy Davis Jr. because he took the threats very seriously. Davis's assistant, Arthur Silber, found him in their suite at the Sands Hotel, frantically flipping through his address book. Silber asked him what he was doing. 
He responded, I got the call this morning. I have to marry a black lady, and I'm looking for someone to marry. Eventually, he found someone, a local dancer named Lore White. He immediately called her and made a truly scandalous proposition. Davis invited White to come to his suite, and when she arrived, he dropped his bombshell. He would pay her to marry him, then dissolve the marriage after a year. He hoped that a year might be long enough to get the mob off his back. White agreed, and they were off to the races. Davis was miserable, but there was nothing else he could do. And to make matters worse, people couldn't have been happier for him. The first person to call Davis to congratulate him on his upcoming nuptials was Evelyn Cunningham, one of the leading voices in the black press. It hadn't just been white people who were against his relationship with Kim Novak. Cunningham had frequently written about his obligation to the black community, and she was overjoyed that Davis had finally found a black woman to share his life with. If she'd known the dark truth, she probably would have sung a different tune. Sammy Davis Jr.'s first wedding wasn't exactly romantic. The location was pretty nice in the Sands Emerald Room, but the bride was 40 minutes late to a ceremony that lasted all of two minutes. Then it was done. Davis and White were man and wife. Neither was particularly happy, but White at least made sure she got hers. As soon as she became Mrs. Sammy Davis Jr., Lorraine White went nuts on a shopping spree. Jet Magazine ran a photo of her with 20 new pairs of shoes. Davis showered her with even more gifts to show his gratitude for getting him out of a sticky situation. White even got to stay in the Sands presidential suite, but when she returned to the room, she returned alone. Meanwhile, Davis only got more and more miserable. Luckily, his marriage to White was short-lived and they were divorced in 1959. This was a particularly low moment in Davis's life, but it would soon pick back up that same year. This was the year that he got his second big break when Frank Sinatra asked him to become a member of the famous Rat Pack. Sammy Davis Jr.'s time in the Rat Pack was one of the most famous of his career. Many may remember him as an actor or singer in the Will Maston Trio, but the Rat Pack is what everyone associates with Davis's career. However, there's a particular moment from his time in the Rat Pack that really affected Davis greatly. This was in relation to President John F. Kennedy. Davis campaigned for John F. Kennedy during his 1960 presidential campaign, performing in 20 cities, usually alongside the rest of the Rat Pack. But at the Democratic National Convention in Mississippi, he was booed while singing the national anthem, an incident that left him near tears. After he won the election, Kennedy snubbed Davis on two occasions. Davis had been invited to Kennedy's inauguration gala and was so proud to be going that he had a special suit made. Britt bought a Balenciaga dress. But three days before the inauguration, Kennedy's secretary called to say that the president was uninviting them. The move was political. The president-elect had won the election by a slim margin, and he didn't want to alienate Southern congressmen by presenting them with Davis's controversial marriage. Davis was deeply hurt and embarrassed by the snub. Then in 1963, Davis and Britt were invited to a White House reception for African-American leaders. Raymond said in an email that when Kennedy saw them there, he hissed at his aides to get them out of here and heard the couple away from photographers. Davis wasn't the first celebrity in an interracial marriage. Singer Harry Belafonte married a white woman in 1957, and in 1912, boxer Joe Jackson was jailed for dating a white woman. But no other prominent interracial marriage received as much publicity as Davis and Britt. I was a little kid when it happened, said Gerald Early, editor of the Sammy Davis Reader. Everybody talked about it. I do think it had an impact. It was one of those things in the 60s that was part of opening up American society a little bit. He and Mae Britt were pioneers in making America more accepting of interracial marriage. In 1967, the Supreme Court ruled in Loving versus Virginia that it was unconstitutional to ban interracial marriage. The culture shifted quickly alongside the legal changes that followed and success movies featuring interracial romance like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Davis himself had also taken on interracial relationships in the 1964 Broadway musical Golden Boy, where he played a black boxer in love with a white woman. Davis and Britt divorced in 1968. The marriage lasted eight years and resulted in three children. According to Davis's biographer Gary Fishgall, Davis and Novak met again at a ball after the 1979 Oscars. They danced together. Afterwards, Davis was amazed. No one had taken a picture of the two of them. No one even cared. Once, when Britt and Davis were first married, Boyer and his wife were sharing a hotel suite with them in Miami. Martin Luther King Jr. came to visit Davis in the hotel, and Boyer said, Martin, where are we racially? Davis interjected and said, I'll tell you where I am. I'm in the best suite in this hotel, but I can't walk down the street with my wife. King replied with the words of a slave preacher, who he would later quote in a speech to the New York Civil War Centennial Commission in 1962. He said, We ain't what we ought to be. We ain't what we want to be. We 
ain't what we gonna be. But thank God, we ain't what we was. Anyway, it was sometime after his shunning by JFK that Davis began to enter his partying stage. When I say partying, I mean truly hardcore, rock and roll partying. He was said to have begun participating in huge orgies while drinking heavily and experimenting with nose candy. But these weren't the only things Davis was beginning to dabble in. At this point, he was also getting his introduction into the occult. The Church of Satan was founded in California in 1966, and apparently Sammy Davis Jr. felt a great affinity towards the church, although he had already converted to Judaism. This is likely to have been introduced to him through the orgies and substances circles he was in, because everyone knows that the Church of Satan sure loves a good orgy and a bit of nose candy. One particularly interesting moment in his Church of Satan days involved Davis being invited to a satanic party by a few friends. When he arrived, he found everyone there in robes with a woman tied spread eagle on an altar. However, Davis later wrote, that chick was happy and wasn't really going to get anything sharper than a dildo stuck in her. But another member at the party wouldn't be as lucky. In the midst of the evening's wild escapades, Davis was casually indulging in some recreational substances while receiving a bit of special attention. Suddenly, one of the secretive leaders decided to add a dramatic twist to the scene by lifting his hood, revealing none other than Sammy Davis Jr.'s personal hairstylist, Jay Sebring. Now for the true crime enthusiast watching, the name Jay Sebring might ring a bell. And if that doesn't strike a chord, how about the mention of his fiancée, the infamous Sharon Tate? Yes, the very same Sharon Tate who later fell victim to the gruesome Manson family massacre. It turns out that Jay Sebring wasn't just a celebrity hairstylist. He was tragically destined to share a horrifying fate with Sharon Tate, bound together and subjected to a brutal attack involving gunfire and multiple stabbings. Talk about a twist in the tale. Anyway, Sammy Davis Jr. kept some of his ties to the Church of Satan, sometimes going out in public with one of his fingernails painted to show allegiance. He would also welcome many of the Church of Satan guests at his shows, sometimes leaving front row seats available for them. At one point, the Church of Satan actually gave him an honorary second-degree Church of Satan membership, which made Sammy Davis Jr. an honorary warlock of the Church of Satan. JFK's previously mentioned betrayal may have been what eventually pushed Sammy Davis Jr. to support Republican Richard Nixon during his presidential campaign and during his presidency. This support for Nixon, who was not seen as a supporter of the civil rights movement, was seen as a disgrace to the black community. They saw Davis as a sellout and more of a joke than an incredible entertainer. This began a true downfall for Davis in the face of the public. His substance and alcohol AB had steadily grown up to this point, and he was truly pressing his luck. At one point, he opened a show with a single song and stopped the show afterwards, which was not like Sammy Davis Jr. at all. He did eventually quit using nose candy, but the drinking was another story. He drank so much alcohol that he ended up being diagnosed with a diseased liver. After this, he was told by doctors that he would die if he took another drink. Luckily for the entertainment world, he did did as he was told and stopped his drinking completely, although he still smoked. It was following this unfortunate diagnosis that he began working hard to better himself in many ways. He actually apparently became a great cook, such a great cook that even Bill Cosby himself spoke about his cooking prowess. Davis also built his career back up from the brink of destruction with a few amazing acting roles in films and plays and a hit single with Candyman. He was also dating his soon-to-be third wife, Altavice Gore. The two were married in 1970, and Sammy Davis Jr. seemed to be really on the mend from his wild years. By the 1980s, he was seen as a legend. People had forgotten his friendship with Nixon, and he was revered for the work he had done in the arts. He even starred in an incredible 80s film, Tap where he played an aging tap dancer who could tap dance better than anyone in the film. It's an incredibly impressive film to watch. If you were to call this period in his life anything, you would really call this a comeback for Sammy Davis Jr. But then came the tickle. In August 1989, Davis began complaining of a tickle in his throat and an inability to taste food. Doctors found a cancerous tumor in his throat and he was diagnosed with throat cancer. He was told that he had the best chance of survival if they removed a portion of his throat instead of using chemotherapy. However, Sammy Davis Jr. told the doctors that he'd rather die than lose his voice. So he began to undergo chemotherapy and radiation. This leads us to another very unfortunate moment in Sammy Davis Jr.'s story. While he was undergoing treatment for his cancer, there was also an event being planned for Davis to celebrate his 60 years in show business. This would be a large variety show of many different performers paying tribute to Sammy Davis Jr. This was also meant to include a performance from Davis, but he was too ill due to his treatment to perform. However, towards the end of the show, the feelings overwhelmed him, and he decided to put on his tap shoes right there in the audience. The audience cheered while he took the stage with fellow tap dancer Gregory Hines, 
he proceeded to deliver one of the most incredible tap dances you could hope to see, making it look effortless compared to the younger Gregory Hines. It was an incredible performance and it was also Sammy Davis Jr.'s final performance. On May 16, 1990, Sammy Davis Jr. passed away in his home in Beverly Hills, California at the age of 64. Two days following his death, the neon lights of the Las Vegas Strip were darkened for 10 minutes as a tribute. However, this is not the final unfortunate portion of this story. In the aftermath of his passing, Davis left behind an estate estimated at $4 million, bequeathed predominantly to his widow, Altavice Davis. However, financial shadows loomed large, as Davis carried a substantial debt of $5,200,000 to the IRS. With interest and penalties inflating the amount to over $7 million, Altavice found herself shouldering the burden of his fiscal obligations due to her co-signature on his tax returns. Forced to liquidate his personal possessions and real estate, Altavice received Received support from industry peers like Quincy Jones, Joey Bishop, Ed Asner, Jane Meadows, and Steve Allen, who rallied together in a fundraising concert at the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas. The posthumous echoes of Davis's financial struggles painted a bittersweet epilogue to the life of a legendary performer. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.